Uh, okay, so um, if you've read the program or seen on the website, um, you may have noticed that you know, the, one of the things I bragged about my presentation is that it was going to consist entirely of code, right? Now, you may actually notice that this is a slide, which means that I am a liar. Uh, but I, I have to tell you, I did a presentation that consisted entirely of code uh, a couple months ago, and although it went well, it was kind of nerve-wracking. So this is actually to make life easier for me. Um, before I go further, let me just check the audio. Okay, this is a, okay. So really quickly, uh, this is a prosumer application called Reason. And uh, this is an application for making music. And I'm actually just throwing in a sound check really quick here, right? So, there, sound, wonderful. Okay, now here, um, although you know I have in fact been a liar with this stuff, I'm gonna show you some code really quick. Okay, so let me make that even bigger. Okay. So, in order to use this, I'm gonna need my TextMate window open. And I'll make that bigger so you can see it, okay? This is basically all the magic happens here. All right, wake up, damn it. There we go. I found out what I did wrong. Hold on. There we go. So by changing this number, I get it to change the beat, which is nifty. But it's not. I don't know, it's not that fantastic, right? It's just a beat over and over again, right? But you can change it a little bit more by doing this. And uh, give it a second to kick in. And if you pay attention, you'll, you'll notice it's actually quite different than it was a few moments ago. Which was actually achieved with a, a fairly small number of changes. So, you know, having said that I was going to show you only code, I felt, you know, obligated to at least start off with a little code. And there's going to be more code a little bit later on. But right now, let me just turn this off and... Uh, All right. So yes, I'm a liar, right? But I am going to show you a bunch of Lambda and Ruby. But I'm actually going to start off by showing you uh, pictures of a techno party in Los Angeles. Um, and what makes that interesting is it starts with a laptop. And if you kind of watch these pictures, you'll see laptops in a lot of these pictures, right? You also see people partying, having fun, and so on and so forth. And this is interesting because as geeks, as programmers, we can say to each other, dude, this is going to be a wicked party. I'm going to bring my laptop, okay? <laughs> now, it used to be the case that this was a very unusual thing to say, right? But the reason I bring this up is if you look at the pictures of this party, you can see that lots more people today can say, dude, this is gonna be a wicked party, I'm gonna bring my laptop. And you can even say, dude, this is gonna be a wicked party, that guy is gonna bring his laptop. And it actually makes sense, where in the past it might not have. Okay, so my name is Giles Boquette, here I am with a laptop, here I am at a party. Okay, so if you, uh, you know, spend, a, whoa, if you spend a lot of time reading blogs, which I do, um, one thing that people blog about a lot is this question of like, what are programmers? And the question comes from the idea that some people have 
suggested or proposed that a programmer is a type of artist. Now, if you've read The Gang of Four, you know that you need to favor composition over inheritance. So it might be more reasonable to say that a programmer has an artist somewhere inside, right? <laughs> but whatever perspective you take on it, this is actually an old idea. This is Kai's Power Tools from 1992. It looks very cheesy, but at the time, it was a very, very innovative uh, piece of software, right? Groundbreaking. The guy who uh, made it was called Kai Krauss, and he said that he thought that the, uh, the ongoing process of creating software, you know, adjusting it, making new versions, was like performance art that played out over the space of months. And he said that, you know, fundamentally, software is performance art. This is kind of a strange thing to say. Zed Shaw, he did a podcast recently where he described Mongrel as an art project. And hopefully, a lot of you have heard uh, Steve Jobs. He has this saying, real artists ship. Right? And it goes back much, much further than that. Right? There's this guy, Leonardo da Vinci, who was you know, widely renowned as one of the greatest artists alive. He also did these anatomical studies and made major contributions to the science of his time. You know, this you know, drawing was not just done for the sake of making, making pretty pictures. This was also, let's draw the bone structure so that other people can understand how bone structure works. Right? This was 500 years ago. This was a big deal. But even though uh, Leonardo was a real artist, in some cases, he did not ship. This is a hang glider he designed. He was not able to find anybody in 1500 to build a hang glider. Uh, this is a bridge he designed in 1502, which uh, he was also not able to find anybody to build. But somebody, uh, the Norwegian government, built it in 2001, and they just used his design, put it together, and it worked. Now, if we, if we want to judge this bridge by the standard of release early, release often, <laughs> we kind of have to consider it a failure, right? But I, I wouldn't say that that was a failure for Leonardo da Vinci. I'd say it's a failure of Leonardo da Vinci's time, because it's a failure of wasted genius. They didn't have the ability to leverage his brilliance, even though it was there. OK, so Leonardo was, in a sense, a hacker. And in a very literal sense, he was a painter. <laughs> And this inspired a book called Hackers and Painters, which is really like the, the champion of the programmers are artists idea. And uh, it was put together by a guy called Paul Graham, who had previously uh, written two technical books on Lisp, which were very good. And he announced that he was creating a, a dialect of Lisp called ARC. Now, he announced this in 2001. He released it in 2008. And the world did not care. <laughs> And he was outraged, absolutely just shocked. Like, how could people not see how wonderful ARC is, right? So he created the, the ARC Challenge, again in 2008. Right? It's the ARC de Triomphe in, in either Paris or possibly New York. I'm not sure, the Marble Arch. But maybe both. Uh, this is the ARC Challenge, right? Build something that does what my code does and make it as small as my code is. Because he's like, terseness is power. ARC is unbelievably terse. This is the best language ever, right? So Jim Wyrick took code, you know, which, the guy who made Rake and Ruby Gems, uh, took code that he had written with Chad Fowler in 2005 and defeated the ARC challenge about three days later. And he did it using continuations. Now, in fairness to Paul Graham, You're gonna move your speaker, but keep okay. In fairness to Paul Graham, the whole idea of using continuations on the web in that way was his idea, but. I personally think you still have to give. Oh, oh okay. Uh, <laughs> that was weird. Uh, a grade of fail. And the reason is that real artists ship, right? And that's the moral of the story. If you have a really cool idea, don't wait seven years to release it. Because the code that he wrote, that uh, Jim Wyrick wrote, that defeated the art challenge, was based on Seaside. And Seaside was based on ideas from uh, Paul Graham. If he had released it when he thought of it, the world might have been less bored. OK, so you know, just to add insult to injury, um, this is the only website built on ARC that I know of. It's uh, news.ycombinator.com, which recently collapsed. You'll notice that it says, there's a problem in the server software. When the load gets high, it fails catastrophically. So again, fail, right? by which I mean fail. Or in other words, <laughs> fail. Right? But this actually breaks my heart, because the way ARC was described, the way Paul Graham spoke about it and wrote about it, it was beautiful. It was this beautiful idea. So in honor of that beautiful idea, which did not actually happen, 
um, I'm giving my code, Archaeopteryx, the nickname Arx, which obviously is short for Archaeopteryx, right? And Archaeopteryx is a Ruby MIDI generator, and that's the code that I was just showing you. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, MIDI, what's MIDI? MIDI is the lingua franca for uh, digital music. Uh, if you've got software that creates music, if you've got hardware that creates music, if it was made after about 1979, it's guaranteed to have MIDI in it. And in some cases, this even applies to things like your, uh, your iPhone. Um, it is it, the lingua franca. I mean, I, I took Version America here, and they had a problem with the little screeny things that you know, they show you, uh, you know, the movies on, you know, red, beta like I want beta software on an airplane, you know? But they had a problem with it, so they had to reboot it. So, you know, it's Linux. So I was watching, like, the little command line that tells you what it's booting. One of the things it booted was MIDI, right? It is the common language for all digital music. And uh, it was created in the 80s. It stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And there's a gem for it uh, in Ruby. It doesn't do uh, live MIDI like I was just doing. It does uh, MIDI files. It's called MIDILib. So I got this thing in 2005. And I combined it with some continuations code, again by Jim Wyrick, which I got from the Ruby way, and uh, you know, then adapted to feed fractals to the MIDI, right? and I made some music with it. Uh, and this music was cool, but it was too freaking weird. <laughs> and I'm actually going to give you an example so that you can see that, uh, that when I say it's too freaking weird, it really is too freaking weird. Here we go. What the? F okay. Why can I not hear my music? Yeah, this is plenty weird, huh? It's like John Cage. Yeah, it's very, yeah. <laughs> Ironically, the whole thing was inspired by aleatoric experiments by John Cage, but it was noisier than this. Um, okay, well, it doesn't matter because it really was too freaking weird. <laughs> and uh, if you really want to find it, you can go to this URL. And it's there, gilesgoatboy.org slash ruby slash midi.html. Um, long story short, it sounded like R2D2 meets Aphex Twin. Right? <laughs> now, I was able to repurpose it later to generate ambient music, which didn't sound quite so weird. But what it did sound was boring. Right? Ambient music is just like, you know, which is cool, but you know, it, it didn't really captivate my, my imagination. Um, so you know, I kind of put it aside. And then I was working for the guys who uh, started the company Heroku. I was working at the company they had before. And uh, one of them told me that the other one had built something really interesting for Burning Man, which is uh, basically it had a database of MP3s. The MP3s were tagged. And it had some beat matching software in C. Right? So what you do is you take this thing to your tent at Burning Man. You turn a, uh, a button. You click. You turn it on. Right? And then you just leave it running. And it generates music mixes on the fly for hours. It was a real-time automatic robot DJ. And I was like, dude, that's awesome. You've got to, to, you know, to take this thing, to do something with it. You, know, you, could, you could sell this to you know, bars or something. I mean, this is wicked. And he's like, well, you know, I, I think of it as something kind of silly. Right? <laughs> it's basically for fun. Right? Now, uh, I, I, I'm sorry to have to say this, but you know, although I respect that, it's cool that you had a fun project. right? If you refer to Archaeopteryx as a project for fun, you may get slapped, right? And you know, here's an illustration of what may happen, right? I, I'm not even kidding, right? I'm not going to slap Ryan Davis, but you know, it could happen to you, right? And the reason is that real artists ship, OK? So let's just you know, put that aside. Now, Ryan works for a company called Engine Yard, which if you're into Ruby, you probably know about and respect, because they are very cool, right? Engine Yard recently got an infusion, or in some cases you may even work for them. Uh, they recently got an infusion of venture capital, right? And they're investing that venture capital in open source. Now, what's interesting about this is this comes from Benchmark Capital. The company that invested in Engine Yard is called Benchmark. And they also invested in JBoss, MySQL, and Spring Source. All these companies do open source development and make the money on technical support, right? So what Engine Yard is doing with this investment of venture capital is they're doing open source development and making money on hosting and scaling. Right? 
So the benchmark strategy for open source is that open source enriches the ecosystem. So you use it to build the market, and then you provide services against that market. Now, it's perfectly reasonable to wonder what this has to do with Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. Leonardo da Vinci worked in a time where uh, he worked as an engineer for money. Like, he would just build things and people would give him money. But he also, as an artist, was part of this system in those days called patronage, where what you would do is you would have a noble patron who would fund your living expenses, and then you would draw and paint and so on and so forth. And implicit in this deal is that you would um, draw pictures of them and make them look like they were the best looking people for miles. I mean, that was basically the job, right? So um, that has a relationship to venture capital, which I'll get into in a moment. But I just want to say, yeah, yeah, some of you can guess what that relationship might be, right? Uh, you know, venture capital, right? Uh, so I was in San Francisco during the dot-com boom, and there was a lot of startups, right? And it was kind of cool, and people were like, dude, startups, it's an adventure, right? But the weird thing is, I kind of wanted to be in on that adventure, but I didn't actually have the patience for it. And it's kind of strange to think that you don't have patience for an adventure, right? Adventures require courage, right? But, you know, realistically, to get the venture capital thing to work, you have to get stock options, they need to vest, and that takes four years, right? So I'm kind of skeptical because my benchmark for adventure, you know, um, I've, I've like slid downhill in the snow with these blizzards. I fell down a waterfall. I, I got arrested once. Admittedly, I was arrested for speeding tickets. But still, <laughs> I, I, I was threatened by gangbangers. Uh, my brother came to visit me where I lived in this gangbanger neighborhood, and he got shot at. Right? Because I, I wanted to, uh, you know, when I left high school, I wanted to be a writer. So I, I found the cheapest neighborhood in Chicago that I could so that I could live there cheaply and have a lot of time for writing. Um, and the, the cheaper your neighborhood, the higher your likelihood of uh, bullets. So, but nobody was hurt, right? So I've been to illegal raves in foreign countries. When I lived in New Mexico, there were bear droppings outside my front door within like a five foot radius all the time. There was a brief period where I was carrying a 357 Magnum at night because there was a cougar in the area. And, uh, you know, my, my parents, they were actually building this house. By this time, I was in uh, Santa Fe, right, which is near Pecos, right? I was living with my folks when I was in Pecos, right? And uh, they, they had a guy who was, you know, helping them build their house, and he was attacked by a rattlesnake. So he killed it with a shovel, and they threw it on the barbecue. So, you know, I'm living in Santa Fe. I'm near my folks, right? It's great to live near your folks because you can come by and visit them, right? So I go by and visit them, right? But they're in your business, right? So it's like, Mom, Dad, you know, I don't want you to get bored in your retirement, right? I don't want you to be just like sitting around not having a life. So I'm here. I'm here to make your life wonderful. And they're like, oh, that's wonderful, Giles. We've just thrown a rattlesnake on the barbecue. <laughs> Would you like some tea, right? Uh, other things that happened in that area, when I was in Pecos, coyotes tried to eat my dog. Um, there was a psycho who threw rocks at my dad until I threatened him with a piece of rebar. <laughs> one time, I was going, uh, I, I actually spun out, did a 180 at 80 miles per hour downhill on a mountainside in Los Angeles in rush hour traffic in Hollywood on the 101. And when I was 10 years old, I used to climb a tree to get on the garage roof and jump off for fun. So here comes venture capital, right? And they're like, dude, what you need to do is spend four years sitting at a desk. And I'm like, really? Why? Because it's an adventure. You know, no, you know? So I, I don't actually have a high opinion of venture capitalists. I think of them as weasel-brained Muppet fuckers. But the reality is, they're not fools. They're liars, right? So the question is, why do they tell us this story? And it brings us back to patronage, right? Patronage is system where you hire artists to paint pictures of you so that other wealthy people will see how special you are, right? Venture capital is a system where you hire programmers to build useless things so that other wealthy people will see how special you are. In either case, it's artists employed to make wealthy people look good. It's basically the same system. There's only one significant change in 500 years, which is that they've added an escape clause, right? Which is the IPO. If you get extraordinarily lucky, you can make so much money that you become an investor too, and you don't have to spend your whole life as the investor's pet monkey, right? You can actually start investing and collecting pet monkeys of your own, right? <laughs> And this kind of explains a few things, like Google. If you go to Google, if you go to work for Google, what do they do? They buy you toys, right? When a giant corporation spends tons of money on toys, 
it must mean that it has some kind of economic interest in its employees thinking and acting like children. Okay? <laughs> so if we get to be the children, they get to be the daddy. And implicit in that relationship is the idea of it's my money, I'm the boss, right? And that's fine. You gotta have a boss, and let's face it, it it's good money, right? And you get to build cool stuff. In many ways, it's a fantastic life. But there's a problem with this whole thing, right? And this illustrates that problem, right? Leonardo da Vinci was one of the greatest celebrities of his time, right? One of the kings of Europe actually bragged that when Leonardo died, he held Leonardo in his arms. That was the thing that he bragged to other kings, right? Now think about that. You're the king, right? And what do you do when you want to make the other kings feel like they're not as special as you are? I'm down with Leonardo da Vinci, right? He was a big deal. And this thing, which he designed, was not able to build. And the reason why is his patron and the people who you know, might have funded it, they looked at it and they said, it's fun, right? This hang glider, somebody finally built it in 2002 and went hang gliding in it. It worked as designed, but it was never built during Leonardo's lifetime because it was just fun, right? So you know, if you've ever had a project manager come to you and say, can we do X? you know that one of the major things that we do is we uh, leverage and we develop expertise in possibility. But if the ultimate shot calling is done by people who do not actually know what we know, right, then what we actually have to do is work within the context of their sense of possibility, which can be much smaller. right? Here's something that venture capitalists agreed was possible. Pets.com. They poured like $20 million into this site where you could buy pet food over the internet. And when they were done, what they had left was a sock puppet. It was the only thing that they made money on was the sock puppet. So this is the, uh, the stock price curve uh, around the dot-com bust. Right? This curve had been seen once before in American history, right before the Great Depression. Okay? This is where I lived briefly in Pecos. Right? Uh, for a time. I also lived in nicer places, yada yada, but there was a period in Pecos where I was living in this camper. Um, and these dogs were not actually in the camper with me, but they were nearby. Uh, and if you notice down there, it says June 14th, 2001. And uh, there was also a time in New Mexico where I was making seven fifty an hour at a gas station. But in January of 2001, I was making $75 an hour at an investment bank. So I was like, fuck. And specifically, I was like, fuck venture capital, right? I was even like, fuck programming. And what I did is I spent a lot of time uh, learning to draw. That's my head. That's my thumb. That's my hand. That's not my girlfriend, but it would have been nice. That's some graffiti. That's a t-shirt. That's uh, abstract sunset. And this is a record. I made two of these, right, two DJ records. It was actually quite expensive by my standards at the time. And they totally failed to sell, right? Fail, by which I mean fail, right? I understand the heartbreak of fail, right? <laughs> but, but even given all that, like living in this camper was actually a very nice experience, right? Because I got to be a starving artist. And this actually took me back to when I had been in Chicago and been a starving artist. But the downside of being a starving artist is that I did not ship. So anyway, when I think about venture capital, I think of two things. I think of economic instability and sock puppets. And just as I would say that the inability to build these bridges was a failure of Leonardo's day, I would say that this whole situation is a failure of our day. Because venture capital wastes money as well as talent. So in the aftermath of the dot-com bust, there was this book by the 37 Signals guy, Getting Real. Right? And here's Seth Godin, who is you know, a very good business writer, who everyone should read if they're serious about business. This is a very good writer. And he said that like, this book is something you need to read. Right? The basic idea of this book is that you disregard venture capital. You build something profitable. You don't quit your day job, because web apps are cheap to build. Right? And you think about the word cheap, it has a of connotations. But what I'd like to suggest to you is that cheap is fantastic, because it's your money so you're the boss, and that allows you to leverage a much greater range of possibility. 
Now, the thing is, there's actually another benefit to this whole cheap thing, which is that it tends to result in very good software. Right? Basecamp was built this way, on the side. Right? While they were working on other things, they put 10 hours a week into Basecamp. Delicious was built this way, on the side, while he was holding down a full-time job at an investment bank. Dig was built also in this way. Facebook was built in this way. There's a picture of Darth Vader in a sombrero. <laughs> Measure Map was built this way. <laughs> and it sold. It was the first Rails app to sell, right? Twitter was built this way, right? Cheap results in good software. And in a sense, you could almost say that our engine yard was also built this way, because although it was built full time, it was not built in the venture capital style. Let's build something and then you know, have a liquidation event. You know, they were like, well, let's make a business. Let's be profitable, right? And um, you know, what, I, what I heard is that when the venture capitalists came to Engine Yard, Engine Yard was able to say, they need us. We don't need them, right? And this is actually a trend. If you look at this, this is a Boing Boing. You know, VCs sitting on giant piles of money that internet startups don't need. This is TechCrunch, right? As startups become cheaper to launch, more and more venture capitalists are finding themselves left out in the cold, right? Being cheap gives you tremendous leverage, tremendous power. It's a great thing. Um, so what are we talking about here, right? There's basically three things going on at the moment. Venture capital, open source, getting real. Uh, there's Boba Fett in a Fez. So getting real is actually also uh, something that, you know, this is where Rails came from. And the idea with Rails is let's build functionality and then extract a framework from it. And of course, that was marvelously successful. Um, another framework in Ruby, Adhesion, right? Uh, I'm not sure if it was exactly built on the same principles, but this is uh, kind of interesting because Adhesion is a voice over IP framework, right? And the guy who built it, built it when he was in college, right? And uh, he started going to conferences and speaking about it. He started you know, promoting it on the webs, the interwebs. And several years later, um, what he says is, my career is adhesion, right? Now, you know, voice over IP in Ruby is a niche market. But what's interesting is that to some extent, he created, this is Jay Phillips, he created that niche market, right? And this is the, uh, the strategy that we were just talking about, or that I was just talking about, Royal We, right? Open source enriches the ecosystem. You build the market and then provide the services, right? By creating this framework, he created a, uh, a market for the framework to operate in, right? By encouraging people to use it, by you know, developing it, and da 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 da. So you know, we know that, to some extent, internet startups are becoming too cheap to fund. But what's possible is that internet startups are also becoming too small for venture capitalists to even see. Because this idea, open source enriches the ecosystem, build the market, then provide the services, right? This idea is you know, powering investment by benchmark capital, but it's also powering one person's career, right? So that means that one person's career is an internet startup. And because all it takes is building something useful that people want to use, yours can be too. So um, this is why if you refer to Archaeopteryx as fun, you may in fact get slapped in the diagram. Because let's use our imagination, right? Say it's a couple years from now, and I'm telling somebody my career is Archaeopteryx. OK, so as you may have guessed by the impersonation earlier, my parents are English, right? That gives me uh, the right to live in England or, in fact, anywhere in Europe. Now, this music that I was playing to you at the start of the presentation is very, very, very big in England and Europe, right? Here's a guy, uh, like those other DJs I was showing you before, performing music of roughly this nature in Europe. And you'll notice that the place is so big that you can't even see the people, right? This is a giant arena. I think it's in, like, Athens. This might be the Colosseum. I don't know. But it's huge. And this guy, his name is DJ Sasha, he's rumored to charge $25,000 per night. Okay? This appears to be his mixer, but it is not. He mixes using software. This is actually a unique piece of hardware that does not exist anywhere else in the world but wherever DJ Sasha happens to be. It is a custom-built MIDI controller. And he had it built because the software exposes new creative possibilities to him. Now, since that software runs on MIDI, if you have software which generates music and generates MIDI, you can control that software. Specifically, 
I, with Archaeopteryx, will control that software. And more to the point, I'm going to do it by July because I've already committed to perform with it at uh, Ruby Fringe in Toronto. So as you can guess, I don't get a whole lot of sleep. <laughs> but you know, if you think about the fact that somebody got paid to build this custom MIDI controller for this DJ, there's already a niche market, right? And if I find a way to get people interested in this particular system, I will be creating a niche market, right? And you know, let's just say for the sake of imagination that I get this thing to be profitable, right? Then one day maybe I can say my career is Archaeopteryx. But what if I get it to be only slightly profitable, right? Like I can, you know, maybe a little money on the side is all I get from it. Then I can say my career includes Archaeopteryx. And as a worst case scenario, it is not that bad. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's possible that all you need for a business to succeed, an IPO is not part of the necessary requirements. It might be useful, it might be good, but you don't actually need an IPO. What you need to do is profit. So one way to profit is by providing a superior alternative at an equivalent price point. So that's the plan with Archaeopteryx, right? Um, it uses a probability matrix for rhythm generation. It uses a common Lisp object system style of method redefinition, which gives me tremendous flexibility. Uh, there's a plan, which is still vaporware, for user-generated psychedelic visuals. And uh, it's worth keeping in mind that the entire audience at the party, or the entire dance, is the user. Because this is social software, right? That is to say, it targets a crowd, right? You don't even have to be on the web to use social software. You don't even have to use HTTP to be social software. But I'm planning to, and we'll get to that. So probability matrix rhythm generation and the common lisp object system for flexible method redefinition. So I'm going to explain that now. I'm going to show you some code. OK, so first, the probability matrix, OK? The idea here is that uh, most, most uh, like drum machines, right? Like here's the drum machine that, that makes these noises. Where'd it go? Ah, OK. Right, that's a drum machine, OK? It's got this thing down here, which is um, a step sequencer, right? And what you do is for each drum, you choose a step for it to play on, right? So here's, here's a very, like, uninteresting rhythm, but... Right? What I did is I just, you know, that's for this drum here, the one that's lit, right? And I selected, uh, you know, some beats for it to play on. And here's, for another drum, some other beats. Right, so whatever. Um, let me just fix that. Take that out. OK, so obviously what I'm doing is I've got these columns and I've got this row, right? So that's a matrix, right? It's a 16 uh, column matrix with 10 rows. Each row represents a drum. Each column represents a beat, right? So that's cool, but that only generates one rhythm, right? What if you want to generate an um, entire set of rhythms, right? What I do with Archaeopteryx is I define a probability matrix that says a drum is x amount likely to play at this particular moment, right? And then I throw random numbers at it, or I can just send it certainty, right? If I give it this, 1.0, that represents 100%, right? So it's only, hold on. Yay, OK, you can see it now. It's only going to play those drums which are absolutely guaranteed to play, right? Ah, but that's weird. Why is it only doing that? It's because it's got this other lambda here, which I'll explain in a moment. Right. So what I'm doing there is I'm saying play everything that's 100% likely to play, right? If I do 0 0.9, it's everything that is 90% likely to play, right? 
And if I do 0 .0001, it is virtually everything that could play. Right? But the most interesting thing to do with it is to uh, use random numbers, throw the random numbers at the probability matrix. You get a new rhythm every time. But those are um, very, very subtle differences. And it's entirely possible that you might not have even noticed what the differences were in those two rhythms. I just dropped a couple hi-hats, right? And that's because of this thing here, which is, uh, it says next, right? This is a, um, basically this represents how you choose what, uh, what strategy to play next. Let me see if I can, um, Clarify this a little. So, whoa, do you guys see that? <laughs> That's weird, huh? <laughs> Whatever, it works, you know? Okay. Okay, so I think these are probably the only ones. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, this is the main object, and it's called an ARCS, which is a you know, BS name, but I'll fix that later, right? So what this does, right, is it's got this main thing here. It generates the beats, right, for all the measures, mutates them if necessary, uh, and plays the notes returned from the generator, right? Uh, and play just means for each note, send it to the MIDI object to play it, right? So a generator, uh, here's a generator. The drum is a generator. Uh, and there's a couple others, but this is the one that uh, is probably most interesting to look at. Okay. So, you know, obviously, this here is going play, generator, notes, beat. So let's look at notes. <coughs> Where's notes? OK, that doesn't help. Um, well, I don't remember how this works, but I'll give you the basics. Uh, basically, it, it has this uh, array of beats on which to play, right? It goes through the probabilities for any particular drum, right? So it's going through this array here, right? So it goes through each probability with the index, and then it checks the probability against the number generator. Right? Now, if you used lambdas a bit, you know that you know, using these square brackets is the equivalent to, if it was a, uh, if it was a method, right, it would look like this, self.numbergenerator. Right? And you could uh, leave out the self, and you could leave out the parentheses. Right? But that's what would be happening. Right? But what I'm doing instead is I'm doing the lambda and the square brackets. right? So this number generator is this here, right? And you'll notice the capital L, that's just a shorthand for lambda. So what I'm doing is I'm giving it a proc, which generates numbers. And that way I can change it you know, very flexibly, right? So it's like having a method which generates numbers, except you can change it whenever you want, right? So instead of, uh, instead of saying, I've got uh, uh, this object which has a method, uh, I've, I got this idea from the common Lisp object system, which it's not quite replicated, but it's kind of similar to. What I'm saying instead is that there is a slot where some executable code will live, and I can swap that out at will, right? And where that becomes interesting is with this whole when thing, right? When, right here, okay, first it goes through the beats that it determines you're going to play on by, by sending the number generator against the probability. Right? And then it rolls it into, rolls it into a array filtering lambda, which is up here, which creates a lambda of literals so that I don't overtax the garbage collector. Right? And the uh, lambda of literals just says when, uh, you know, which beats to play on. Right? But instead of just using that right away, what I do instead is I throw it in the queue. Okay? And then I pull out. Um, the strategy for when, if you know gang of four, this is a strategy pattern, right? Next is how I pull it out of the queue. I pass the queue to a lambda called next, right? And I can define next here, and you'll notice there's several of them, right? This is the one I use to generate, uh, you know, really straightforward beats, right? And then if I want to make it more uh, varied, I do it like this, right? And you'll notice that this first next, the one that's predictable, it just says pull you know, queue, it receives a queue, and then it gives you back what's at the top of the queue, right? What you can also do is it receives a queue, and then it just randomly chooses something from the queue, right? And that sounds...
that gives you more variety, right? Now, obviously, since these are lambdas, I could throw any arbitrary executable code block in there and have it choose what to play next in any of a variety of ways. So again, gang of four, what I'm using is a strategy pattern called next to select strategies called when. So this is a uh, meta strategy pattern, and it has three parts, right? There's a lambda here, there's a lambda here, and there's code which throws one against the other, right? So in three lines, we have not only a strategy pattern, but a meta strategy pattern. I have to leave space for, um, for questions. So I'm going to get back to the slides if I can sort out what's going on here. Just really, really quickly. What the hell? OK. So uh, one thing that you should know is I got this code from Practical Ruby Projects. That is to say, the code which generates MIDI events. This is a fantastic book. I very highly recommend it. Excellent book. Uh, also, you know, the awesomeness of reason is a big part of it. Uh, here's a picture of Kate Beckinsale, which I have no way to justify. Uh, here's the vaporware alert. What I'm going to tell you about next, it doesn't exist yet, may never exist, depending on whether or not I can find the time to finish this thing. But what you do is you take a drum, right? You give it a touch sensor with a Bluetooth or whatever, and you hook it up to Ruby processing. Um, does anyone, do you know what processing is? Who knows what processing is? Wonderful. Okay. So many people know what processing is, and you know, for the rest of you, Google it. It's awesome. Ten minutes, I know. Um, what it does is it basically gives you, it's a programmatic way of generating visuals. It's very cool. It's very powerful, right? So if you've got this on a screen above the drum, right, communicating with the drum, then the touch sensor triggers the visuals. And this allows you to get user-generated psychedelic visuals. But I said before that the crowd is the sensor, because um, the crowd is the user, because it's social software. So you've got this touch sensor, right, inside a drum, right? You hook it up to a REST client, again on a Mac Mini or whatever, right? You put it on a local area Wi-Fi network, password protected, low latency, not connected to the interweb. interweb. Uh, and this box here can be a server, right? So the drum communicates a timestamp to the server, right? And you can have several of these drums. And that allows you to do what is really innovative about web machines or whatever's startups, what have, what have you, is you can leverage machine learning, right? Because updating a probability matrix is absolutely trivial. All it is is a two-dimensional matrix of floats, right? Between zero and one, it's not a big deal, right? But if you are able to leverage machine learning against a music generator, this means that your users can influence the music generation in real time. And remember I said I needed to provide a superior alternative at an equivalent price point? This will do that, right? And additionally, you might wonder, how the hell am I going to harness this information in a useful way? I don't know. But it doesn't matter. Because this flexibility makes it very, very easy to just change the strategy. Uh, I have no way to justify this picture either, but I stole it from Logical Awesome, which is a good uh, you know, company. Uh, and I believe it's relevant, because some of what I'm talking about is like science fiction, right? I mean, the idea that this person that you are looking at is actually going to finish building this system and turn it into a business, that idea is insane. But if it happened, it would be great. So we combine those two things, insanely great, right? That comes to us via Steve Jobs, who, as we know, says real art is ship. What's interesting about this is that he actually stole it from Andy Warhol, who said that good business is the best art many years before. But let's get back to Steve. Steve is of the old school, where what you need is $20 million to turn a profit, right? And being old school, he might say, Giles, you're giving away valuable intellectual property. You madman. To which we could say, Steve, you fool, we're opening up new creative possibilities, right? Because open source enriches the ecosystem. You build the market, you provide the services, right? You don't need to have an IPO or an exit strategy. Fuck that shit. You don't want to build fail 2.0, <laughs> right? If this thing starts to work, I can just you know, consult for DJs. Crazy, but it might happen. It might not. It probably won't, but it would be cool if it did. Anyway. This whole idea of fail 2.0, which is what the venture capitalists are you know, intent on creating, right? that results, results in wasted money and wasted talent. I can't really call myself a genius, but you know, wasted talent and not least wasted passion. right? Because you've got these people who are like, dude, I am passionate about you know, uh, business to consumer requisitionizing. You know? And it's like, how sad would it be if you really were passionate about that? It's like the saddest thing in the world. It's like an accountant who's like, I'm passionate about tax law. 
No, give it up. You're not. You know, you just think you should be, so you say it, right? So, you know, what if you were to take your real passions, like the things that you love, right? Computers are everywhere, which means that if you know how to control them in a powerful way, you can do anything with them, right? And this whole idea of a programmer is an artist, or a programmer has an artist, or extends the functionality of an artist, whatever ridiculous way you want to extend this metaphor, right? What if we were to say, you know, forget all that, right? A programmer, you know, maybe the discussion is wrong. Maybe the question is wrong. Maybe the fact that you are a programmer is not even a question of what, right? Maybe it's just a question of how, right? So this is my theory, my advice, right? Apply programming to your passions. Never build anything for venture capitalists. Build something you believe in, that you passionately want to exist, that you sincerely believe should exist. And remember that real artists ship, right? And that's basically everything. And I'm almost ready to open it up for questions. But I do have to say one more thing, which is that if you notice the picture of Kate Beckinsale, you notice there was all these pictures of you know, hot chicks at a party. It's, you, know, you might wonder, like, why on earth would I put that in there? It's because it helps people pay attention. But I did this presentation where there were all these pictures of Jessica Alba. And at this conference that I gave this presentation, there was another speaker who was female. And she said to me, that was a great presentation. And I was like, oh, thank god, because I thought, you know, Giles, you sexist. I thought that's what she was going to say, right? And I was like, that didn't bother you, the Jessica Alba? She's like, no, it didn't bother me. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But you should throw in a little George Clooney for the ladies. <laughs> so, you know, in the interest of, you know, being a little more egalitarian, here is a little George Clooney. <laughs> and I gave him a hat, you know, because someone told me that, that formal wear is very attractive on men. And he seemed kind of disheveled, right? So I gave him a hat. All right. So uh, my name is Giles Boquette. My project is called Archaeopteryx. And although it is difficult to spell, all these words are difficult to spell, they are also very easy to Google. Thank you. <laughs> OK, I see a question. Uh, how are you actually getting the Can you stand up, please? Uh, how are you actually getting the meeting notes into reason? Okay, how am I getting the mini notes into reason? Okay, so let me turn the, uh, the mirroring back on. Okay, um, uh, hold on, okay. So the way I'm doing that is the stuff that I got from Practical Ruby Projects. Uh, and it all comes down to this file here called uh, Live MIDI. Right? So uh, there is, let's see if it's in here, it's not. Um, there's this thing DL uh, inside Ruby, right? And DL, I think it stands for dynamic linker. Uh, it allows you to link up to uh, pretty much anything that runs in C on your system. So uh, in this case, I'm using core MIDI inside uh, the Mac. But uh, the reality is uh, this code actually includes ways to do it on Windows and Linux as well. But I have no plans to like support Windows or Linux because I don't own Windows or Linux machines. So I just threw that out. Um, because you know who cares about Windows or Linux? <laughs> well, no, Linux is great. Um, but yeah, what, what you do is basically you just use this uh, DL load right, to load the C library. right? And then you use uh, extern to take the C function and create a uh, Ruby equivalent. And then uh, you know you include the uh, the modules, right? Um, and then what it does is it does this weird thing to the capitalization, but basically it just you know I have this C function I want to be able to access through this module. It says no problem, you're in there. Bada bing, bada boom. Any other questions? Questions? Question? Go ahead. Is it ready for download? Is it ready for download? Yes. Um, hold on one sec. Uh, if you Google RP, RP, hold on. Um, Google Archaeopteryx and RubyForge. Uh, it's up on RubyForge, although there are some new things in there that I wrote on the plane that aren't in there yet. But uh, they will be. Uh, other questions? Go ahead. So I can help but ask, uh, how do you get a bunch of drums and an audience to not sound like chaotic craziness? Oh! Sorry. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. I'm not actually going to let them make any noise, right? 
what they're going to do is they're going to hit the drum, right, in a room that is very, very noisy, right? Lots of music, right? They hit the drum. Why? Because they're bored and there's this drum with a screen, right? So you're like, dude, oh, look, there's a drum. Oh, hey, boom, right? And what happens, right? The visuals respond, right? So you're going to be like, dude, I'm going to make the visuals respond. And the natural, like, you know, you're, you're in a place with rhythmic music. You're at a party to hear rhythmic music, right? You're, you're going to start drumming rhythmically to it to produce rhythmic visual effects. And, you know, if you are, you know, stoned or drunk or foolish, you might imagine that that's producing sound, right? What it's really <laughs> producing, it could happen. I'm telling you, it could happen. I would not be surprised. What it's really producing is data that I can use. Like, for instance, say every drum uh, arrives like, you know, three seconds behind the beat, right? Uh, it's, it's absolutely trivial. Right now, this does not have swing, right? Swing is when the music doesn't land exactly on the beat, but like a little before, a little after. It's absolutely trivial to adjust the beat back and forth, right? And the thing is, I, you know, I'm just, I'm not, it's not up to them how things sound. They just provide the data, and then I leverage it whichever way proves to be useful. An experiment. Go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah, you. OK, yeah, I'm just looking at the microphone, but I'll shout. Didn't you think it a little bit of a mistake calling it after an extinct dinosaur? <laughs> uh, no, no, because uh, you know everything goes extinct. That's just life. Uh, and Archaeopteryx may or may not have been a dinosaur. Right? The whole point of Archaeopteryx is that this was the first beast where maybe it was a dinosaur, maybe it was a bird. Right? Because here's the thing, right? right now it's designed for a human operator. Right? If the drums and the code work together sufficiently well, the human operator could disappear from the, the, the picture. And if that happens, it you know, matches Archaeopteryx very well. Because just in the same way that Archaeopteryx was either the first bird or the last dinosaur, this is either you know, the first self-operating algorithmic instrument or the last DJ mixer, you know, in theory. Go ahead. Last question. So, is this, last is this, question. It's a, oh. Go is for this it. good for uh, something other than producing jungle music? Uh, you can also use it for house, uh, techno, <laughs> electro. <laughs> I guess, I guess my question is, can you, can you layer over top of this, right? I'm yeah, I, I've actually got baseline support in there and, uh, you know, a, a very, um, a very skeletal uh, way of doing, you know, pads and melodies, but it's, it's nowhere near where the, uh, where the drums are, so I just didn't throw it in there. But yeah, um, in theory, you could do tango with it, but I'm not really... I've told people that I was planning to because they're nice and they like tango, but I'm not really planning to. Because, <laughs> you know, as you remember from the first slide, I'm a liar. But most this all works. This was all true. Okay, last question. I'm done? Yeah, that's it. Okay, that's it. Thank you.